Okay, this morning, we want to uh, remember that uh, it's our leaders and servers' appreciation and leaders' envisioning. So this afternoon, after the service, we will want to take time to honour the good and faithful servants among us. So these people who love God and selflessly use their gifts and time to serve the Lord. So uh, they are tremendous blessing uh, and God is glorified by their good deeds. So uh, when the Lord has bl blessed them, the Lord has saved them, and uh, to express their love, some of them express it through serving the Lord and a means of serving the Lord so that uh, we can uh, help the church to grow and move forward. So right now, uh, we want to call out different ministry heads and their teams. We know that our reward is in heaven. But until then, we also want to encourage one another. We want to cheer them on because uh, the journey, we don't know how long it takes. Maybe tomorrow it ends. Uh, we don't know when Christ is coming. But we do not know, but we want to cheer these people on. So when I call upon them, uh, we want you to... Uh, uh, Raise your hand and praise them and give a round uh, uh, clap offering for them, okay? So I will announce the ministry, uh, ministry heads uh, based on uh, what I see in front of me. Okay, right now we have, uh, we, I will announce the leader of the team and then their members, okay? So the first one, we have Amplified. The leaders is Ryan Teo and Isaac Lee and their team members. Okay, praise the Lord for them. Next. Hey, sorry, uh, those people, can you stand up when we, uh, we call up your uh, ministry? You can stand up a few times or so. So, uh, we have the Faith Kids, uh, leader Amelia Kong. Okay, those who are in the Faith Kids, can you stand up? We want to honour you. Don't be shy. I know you know your rewards in heaven. I don't want to stand up, but okay, you raise your hand. Huh? So, we want to thank you for serving. I just asked Amelia how many of them. They said that 41 of them. So, you got extra gifts. Give, give her 41 gifts so that you can give to the Faith Kids because they work very hard. They are very important and I, I appreciate uh, their effort uh, in helping the kids to grow in the Lord. Of course, everyone is important in the household. Next one. Myself. Faith Watchman. Okay, this is the very team that uh, pray before the service starts. We come together and pray and uh, we are having a time of uh, intercession and prayer. We pray for many things. We okay, those intercessors, can you stand up please? Intercessor. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Uh, stand up, okay. Praise the Lord for that, for your ministry. Next. Family life, again, uh, not that I want to do it so many times, but uh, I'm there, okay. Family life, we have, uh, we conduct this family life, we conduct two courses a year and uh, we have uh, people from various walks of life uh, joining in this, uh, couples who want to get married and they uh, uh, attend our courses. And then, uh, they are, and then we meet them uh, outside after the course to go further into what they have learned. And one of them uh, today, Faris, and uh, a wife is here. So, shall you give a wave? Hello. They are one of our couples who join our course. So, today uh, they are joining us. Okay. Uh, thank the Lord for that. Those who are uh, family life couples, can you stand up? Please stand up, stand up, please. Praise the Lord. Uh, we have Brother Hong Kyung standing behind. Yes. Brother Albert, B. Guan. Uh, these people all standing up. Thank for their services. We have about six to seven of them helping us. Next, we have Pastor Aggie Chan, her team of missions. Okay, can you stand up? Be going to stand up again, huh? family life and missions together. Where's Pastor Aggie? <laughs> okay, the rest, we thank the Lord for them. Next, we want to honour them. The ushers, so important, right? Putting on their smiles, making sure that you are... Ushers, can you stand up? Praise the Lord for that. Okay, look behind you. There are many people standing up. Next, do we have a next one? We have the worship team. How can we leave it out? Okay, Sister Carol, can we stand up? And the worship team, all of them are here. Praise the Lord for them. A lot of hard work, a lot of practice, a lot of rehearsals. We want to praise the Lord for them for sacrificing their weekends. Once they are on duty, their weekends are burned. Eh? So they come here to present before the Lord. And so also when presenting to the Lord, you are blessed through the worship. Okay, praise the Lord for all this uh, wonderful time together. We'll call upon right now uh, Pastor uh, Isaiah right now to... Uh, oh, sorry, we have another testimony. Uh. Okay, we have uh, one of our worship team member, Brother Satya, who always say, will always say, never say no when I ask him for help. Uh, good morning. Uh, when I'm nervous and angry, I usually talk very fast, so... I'm going to talk very slowly. 
Uh, I serve uh, in the worship ministry as a VP. Uh, though I'm, I'm from a family who has been serving a church for uh, many generations, um, when I was asked uh, to serve, I found there to be ideal because I don't want to be here. <laughs> I'm very nervous in front of people, so I just uh, was happy to take it. It's been years since I've been doing uh, VP. It has not always been easy. Some of the times uh, I have uh, work commitments which will, um, which will be running in the back of my mind. Um, I always ask God, uh, give me two hours, hold the storm, I will come back and do it. Uh, God has always... Uh, stop the storm, but when I come back, uh, the storm is not there anymore. He has not taken me through the storm, but he has stopped the storm completely. I also um, say thanks to God. Many times it's, it's I who do it, but then God always reminds me it's not I, it's, it's for God. It's, uh, it's never uh, a person who is uh, bringing anything up. It's God's grace that uh, that that puts you there. Uh, he equips you. He holds you. He never lets go of your hand when you serve. It's not your skills that are coming out. It's God's grace through you. You're an instrument in God's hand. You are nothing but an instrument. You you get so humbled in front of God when you serve. Um, I always remain that of this ten talent, the talent uh, parable, some are given ten talents, some are five, some are one. I always feel that I got one uh, and I don't want to <laughs> dig up and uh, bury it. I, I always want to say yes to God and use that one talent for God if I can. Um, it is not easy at times without uh, the wonderful worship team uh, around me. All these people, uh, people who don't see there, Adam and all the other team people, uh, it takes a lot of time. They put a lot of effort, Saturdays, even after rehearsal, I see people there. I, I, I see all these wonderful people practicing all through the week uh, to perform on Saturday and Sunday. It's all glory to God. It's nothing for us. It's just glory to God. He has brought us here. And if you have a chance to serve in any of the ministries, you probably will have one or five or ten talents. But if you have a chance to serve in a ministry, I, I really encourage you. He's the one who's going to hold you, carry you, and uh, bless you and your generations through you. Amen. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Satya, you know more one talent. Huh? Because when you give your talent to the Lord, the Lord multiply. We want to praise the Lord for that. So right now, we ask the Pastor Isaiah, to pray for all our servers, our leaders, and also uh, for the service. All right. If you are serving, if you've been serving in different ministry, can I invite you to one more time, stand in your feet wherever you are, upstairs, downstairs, the side hall. You know, can you just stand for one more time? Just stand wherever you are. Everybody who has been called, every ministry that has been, uh, you know, uh, highlighted. If the ministry is not highlighted, Brother Vincent, we, that we, we love what you do in the back. You know, I want you to know the church runs because of these people, okay? The service is what it is because of these people. So we want to appreciate you, Brother Vincent. Could you join us and stand up? You know, let me just pray over you. You know, I want to share with you Psalms 23 verse 5. I love Psalms 23 verse 5 and I believe that this is the scripture that, get, that is for all servers. And it says that you, God will prepare you a table before the presence of my enemy. I don't know how sometimes you serve before, you know, men. You know, sometimes they are Christians but they don't behave like one. You know, there are times where, you know, they, they walked in and, you know, and you think that in the house of God it's easy to serve but, but nevertheless, you know, God says that He will put a table before you, gives you favour before those that you're facing. What I like is that His anointing is upon you and the, one of the promises that His cup will overflow. I believe that, you know, serving God is like this, you know, it's like God pouring and pouring. The more you pour, the more He pours over your life. The more you pour, the more He pours over your life. So I believe the more you serve, the more filled you will become. That's how God teaches us to, to live life in Him. Paul says that, you know, that we are like a drink offering. It was an offering in the temple. It was a drink offering. His life was like a drink offering. That means the more you pour yourself, the more He can pour. More encounter, more power, more anointing, more blessing, more 
more, more. You want more of God? You give more of Him to people. So if you stand, would you lift up your hands and let me just speak this blessing over your life. Your life, Father, we thank you, God, for all the servants, Lord, these heroes that make things happen on every Sundays, Lord. Every weekend, every weekday where they, Lord, prepare, Lord, where they think about the service so that we can have something that all of the people who walked in can encounter God, Lord. Father, we thank you for their selflessness, God. We thank you for the time that they have given unto you. And we pray, God, that for every effort, for every time, for every perspiration and every encounter that they have, Lord, that you will return void in great blessing, God. Your word says that our cup will not, Lord, run dry. As we pour out, you will pour even more. And I pray, Lord, that they will experience a greater glory of your presence, that they will be, they will experience their outflowing. Lord, as they, they pour out, they will experience the outpouring of the Spirit upon their life daily, Lord, on a daily encounter. Lord, I pray your Spirit be upon them, your anointing be upon them, and your favour be upon them, Lord, as they continue to serve and build your house. God, I pray, if they think they are one talent, Lord, reveal the many blessings and the many talents that you are about to unfold upon their life, Lord. We pray and we bless every single one of them. We bless their family. We bless, Lord, all that their hands put in, Lord. May you return a hundred flow blessing, Lord. May next year be a year of great acceleration and fruitfulness upon their life, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Come on, give Jesus a big praise offering. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Thank you, worship team, for serving this uh, this morning, you know, I know it's, it's a little bit uh, uh, time, uh, it's, it's at 11.40, but let me t- turn to your neighbor and say, Pastor is going to preach, okay? Pastor is going to preach and Pastor is going to finish on time, okay? That's a lie, okay, by the way, you know. Anyway, I want to start with a story, and it's this story talks about a Sunday school teacher asking a, a, the, the class, and you realize that I have a lot of these Sunday school jokes, but anyway, this Sunday school teacher asked the class, and when he asked the class this question, you know, he basically was trying to teach the children the names of God, or the many names of God. So this Sunday school teacher turned to the group of students, and uh, children was under the age of five, six years old, so they're very young. So they asked, she, she asked this very question, what is God's Christian name. No, what is God's Christian name? And out of the blue, one little boy, five years old, stretched out his hand and says, Chur, I know the answer. His name, God's name, is Harold. I say, huh? Why Harold? You know, Charlie, he's the, this boy's name is Charlie. He says, Charlie, why Harold? You know, and the boy says, because when Jesus taught us the Lord's prayer, he says, our father, Harold be your name. You know, but I don't know about you, but names play a significant uh, uh, part in our life. You know, name has a certain attribute and reveals certain nature about someone or something. And likewise, in the, the Bible, there are many, many titles and names of God. And one of the things that we read the scripture, we found out that God is our Messiah. He's our Savior. He's also called the Son of God, Son of Man. He's also been called the Friend of Sinners and many more. Of course, as we discover those uh, very nature and aspect of God, we started this series uh, two weeks ago with talking about Jesus, our prophet, right? We talk about that. It's interesting, if you look at the Old Testament, you'll find that the three appointed office and three appointed and anointed office that was given to people in the Old Testament, and they were all separated. There was the office of a prophet, there was an office of a priest, and there's an office of a king, and in the Old Testament, none of them was uh, one person that had two offices. It's either you're a prophet, you know, or either you're a priest, or either you are a king. And there was no way that one would become another. It was a separate anointed office that was given to each one of them. But interestingly, the Bible tells us of a person in the New Testament that was different. He was a prophet, as we discovered last week. You know, today, you know, to next week, we'll discover that he's a king, you know. And of course, today, we are going to talk about he's a prophet. But let me just give you a little bit of recap what a prophet is. According to the Bible, a prophet is someone who reveals God's word, spoke for God, and communicates spiritual truth God wanted the people to know. 
You see that a lot in the Old Testament, they represent God and they are the people who always say, Thus says the Lord. It's people who gives the direction, people who reveals the revelation of heaven to the nation, to the kings, to the people, so that people will not be li living in a place where they are unsure. There was surety. They will go to the prophet. The prophet had the word of God except for a period in the history of Israel where there was a famine of God's word. But nevertheless, there will always be a prophet in Israel that will reveal the word of truth, whether it's judgment, but the whole idea is to bring alignment in the body or the nation of Israel. And then there was a king. For the longest time, there was not a king until the people wanted a king. And of course, we know in the Old New Testament, Jesus became the king of all kings. And, and what happened is that the role of a king is someone who had authority to rule and reign over people. The people who is the governing authority of that nation. It makes sure that everybody is treated well. It makes sure that everybody is, uh, you know, is given a fair share of their allot allocation. It makes sure that the law is implemented in the nation. The king, he has the rule and he has the authority. If the king is unrighteous, the land will be unrighteous. If the king is right, then all the king, all the land will be right. So there was the role and anointing that was placed on a king. But we, today, we want to talk about the priest. Jesus, our priest. You see, in the Old Testament, the responsibility of a priest was to represent the people by praying to God, offering sacrifice to God according to the law in order to cleanse the people of the Lord. In fact, if you study the scripture, you know, the, in the temple, they played many, many roles. And in the Psalms, it reveals that one of the roles was to become an usher in the temple. He says that in the script, in the psalmist, he says that it's better to be one day in the house of the Lord than a thousand elsewhere. It's better to be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord. What you call what, what do you call that? He called that usher ministry. So when you serve as an usher, I want you to know you are actually operating in a priestly office. When people walk into the service, you serve them. You are serving God as a priest in God's house. He's just not the guy preaching. There's only one mic. I cannot give to all of you, okay? But nevertheless, there was an office in the temple. There were people that were uh, assigned to slaughter animals. And they are not butchers. They are anointed butchers for God. And it's, you know, they are there to take the lamb and to put them in the prison altar and to make sure that all the requirement of the Mosaic law is mad but at the same time there is one high priest that the bible says that will go into god's temple you see the temple in the bible in the old testament was divided into three courts the outer courts the holy place and the place called the holies of holies scripture says that in the holy of holies there is an ark that stays in it that is cut, that's dividing the people by a veil that only the high priest is allowed to walk through the veil once a year he walks through the veil and around his, his waist will be a rope with bells and he walks in. The reason for the bell is simply this, is that if the high priest has not prepared himself well for the entry into the Holy of Holies, the presence of God, he might just get struck down and the way to pull a dead body is to pull them by the rope. So the moment the guy walks in and there's no more sound of the bell, me, he's finished. They will try to pull and he will pull it out by the rope. Once a year, walk into the temple so that he can sprinkle the, the blood and to minister to God at the Ark of the Covenant where the Bible says the presence of God dwells. Not just the only presence, but the manifested presence of God where the Shekinah glory of God is found. Here was a priest in the old days. But we thank God that we did not need to go to church this morning with our, uh, with our lambs and uh, doves and our cows and drag them from Tekka all the way to 1A Kim Kiet Road. Well, if you have lamb, send it to my house. But not to church. Right, can you imagine? Drag it all the way and to offer one of the ushers who performed the priestly uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, 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 position and says, hey, you know, Sister Dora, here's my cow. 
And Sister Dora will take the cow, inspect the cow, and bring the cow in front. Thank God that we are not living in that days anymore. What was amazing is this, because of Jesus' death on the cross, He became our priest. He became, became the priest that we needed and that is appointed, that, that is required, that all that we need, and that's what we're going to discover in the next few moments. You know, the, the high priest that all of us can have, that's the reason why we can walk into the house of God without bringing or the need to bring a live animal with us. Everybody say amen. See, Jesus said, or the Bible said in the Hebrew chapter 7, verse 17 about Jesus, he declares that, the Hebrew writer declares that the psalmist pointed out and prophesied about Jesus who died on the cross and rose from the dead. And he says this, that Jesus will be a priest forever. And what happened is this, the old, old Testament priest is now irrelevant because the new priest has arisen and that Jesus is now our high priest. My question to you is this, we, we know a little bit about the cross, we know about what Jesus did on the cross, and, you know, but the question is this, knowing that Jesus is our high priest is one thing, but knowing the kind of high priest is another. So this morning, what I want to do is this, as we talk about Jesus, our high priest, we need to know the kind of high priest that we have. I want you to turn to Hebrew chapter 4 and verse 14 to verse 16 because I'm going to share with you the kind of high priest that we have because Jesus is our high priest and we want to know the kind of high priest that we serve. Amen? Hebrew chapter 4, verse 14 to verse 16. The Bible says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Verse 16. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. What kind of high priest do we have? What kind of priest is Jesus? Let me just share with you. The Hebrew writer the, says that the first thing about our high priest is this. He's the empathetic priest. Our Jesus is an empathetic priest. Scripture says that he's able to empathize with our weakness. Empathize. The word empathize actually means this, to have the same experience more than had, also understands the feeling that you go through. Can you imagine the kind of priest that serve you, that is over you, that is ministering to you, that is performing on, the, on behalf of you, that stands between you and God, that kind of priest who can empathize with what you're going through. I had a spiritual encounter when I was 16 years old. After I had an, uh, uh, an encounter with my dad, my dad found some material in my room that was English literature. It was something that was associated with, you know, a little bit about, uh, it's a little bit English, if I can put it that way. But he thought it was a Christian literature. So what he did was he get a little bit upset, or not, not a little bit, but a lot upset, and he started to be a bit more physical on me. I remember at the end of that whole episode, I had a bruise on my, my cheek and I went to the corner of my room and I knelt down and I cried because I just started in this journey with the Lord. And I prayed and I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, I really, really don't want to go through this. I really, really feel this is so painful. How am I going to go to school with a bruise on my face? You know, I just got a whacking on my face and I just got a bruise for something that was not even Christian. It was just an English literature. Kneeling down there and all of a sudden, my eyes were open. I turned around and I had a spiritual experience. I saw a glowing light and a man walked through the wall. It was not ghost. I was not in panic. I was in, just upset and crying. He walks across the room he came to me when I was crying at 16 years old. You know, and I, lie, lie, I was kneeling down and I was crying. I said, God, I just want to give up. You know, I just don't want to go through this. What, what's, what's the point of getting punched for a literature book? Here comes the man. He walks 
past and he says this very word to me. He says, I know the pain that you go through. It broke me into pieces. The next thing he did was he showed his hands and it was a nail pierced hand. I recall and I thought that what that journey means to me and what experience means to me, as I prepare this message, I realized this. What Jesus was revealing to me was simply this. He was showing that he was empathetic towards what I was going through. He said this very word very clearly. I know what you're going through. And he showed me his hands. Can you imagine if he showed me his hands without saying those very words? It could have meant many, many things. I would be very upset. He said, God, I know, I know, I know you died on the cross. I know that was where, yes, you are the great one. You did the wonderful thing. But the fact that it came only after the very word that was spoken clearly, audibly into my life. He says, I know the pain that you're going through. And he showed me his hand. It shows me the nature of the priest that we have. A priest that is, uh, that is understanding, that is willing, that have gone through what you are going through. He understands, he's been in your shoe and he says this to you. I understand what you're going through. But look what I've done. A scholar once says this about Jesus, the empathetic priest. He says, this is more than knowledge or human infirmities. It is feeling. It is because of a common experience with man. He says, one thing to feel and understand what someone is going through. But it's another thing to be in that person's shoe and go through the same feeling and understand the same experience. The scripture says about Jesus, he, he is such a priest. He's an empathetic priest. Scripture says this, that he is able, more than able in fact, to understand all the weaknesses that you go through. It's interesting the word weakness here. Is the word the incapability, incapacity for something or experience of limitation and of weakness. We go through that and Jesus understood. He went through that. He understood. He is son of God, but he's also son of man. The second thing about how high priest is this. The priest is not only empathetic, but a high priest is the perfect priest. Verse 15 says this, that, but we have one who have been tempted in every way, just as we are. I talk about the definition of weakness. We all went through a certain form of temptation in our life. We all are tempted differently. Some of us are tempted in areas, you know, that some other Christians will say, ah, I have no problem and no issues in regards to that. But in life, we have our weaknesses, we have our limitation, but yet again, we are tempted. Scripture says about Jesus that He is one that has been tempted in every capacity. In the limitation of a human life, He has been tempted in every way. But one of the things that makes Him different and makes Him worthy as a high priest is that Yet, the Bible says, there was no sin found in him. You want a priest that is perfect? I wish I was that priest, but I'm not. I'm an imperfect father, imperfect priest, imperfect in every way. But I thank God that I serve a perfect God who is a perfect high priest for me. He stands before God and the, the, the wonderful thing is this, because if you are perfect and righteous before God, there is no prayer that, that is hindered. There is no word that he says that will be second guessed. And every intercession that he makes and every prayer that he performs and he stands before you and I is always good and right. Perfect in every ways. 
The Gospels reveal two temptations that Jesus went through on the earth. Very clear one. One, he was sent to the wilderness, and in the wilderness, he was tempted after a time of praying and fasting. I realized this. I encounter people in our church after our last prayer and fasting. The moment the fasting was over, everybody was at the coffee shop. We all rush to eat. Oh, can you imagine Jesus 40 days, 40 nights in fasting and prayer? No food, no water, divine. And the Bible says he came to the end of his fast. And the first thing you would feel after a long fast is hunger. Scripture says that he was tempted both in physical, emotional, and also spiritual. You see, from bread to tempting God and to ask Him to bow down so that He can have the divine kingdom given to Him if He would just bow down to Satan. But the Scripture says, even to the point of bowing down, He would not. The second kind of temptation that Jesus went through was in the Garden of Gethsemane. In the Garden, Scripture says in the book of Mark, he perspired, or in our Singaporean term, he sweat. Lah. Sweat, really sweat. And the way he sweat was the gospel writer says, it was likened to blood. It was so intense. There was so much pressure on him because at that point of time, he was making a decision whether to go to the cross because he was holding on to the sin of the world on his shoulder, the burden of the world on his shoulder, the healing that was needed to the world on his shoulder, the plans of God on this, all on that man in God, the Garden of Gethsemane. And the Bible says the prayer was so intense that his prayer buddies were falling asleep. Blood was dripping down. The perspiration or the sweat was likened to blood. And yet, at the end of his prayer, he could have just said, he said, I, I have enough. I give up. But we know this famous saying of Jesus. If it's possible, let this cup pass me by. But nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And he went to the cross. I want you to know, it's not easy to be perfect. It's not easy to not sin. C.S. Lewis, in fact, wrote this in, the, in his book, Mere Christianity. He says that no man knows how bad he is till he has tried very hard to be good. How many of you have tried recently to be good and you realize that it's not easy? I try to be patient, but I realize that I'm more impatient than patient after trying. He says that we never find, we never find out the strength of the evil impulse inside of us until we try to fight it. And Christ, because he was the only man who have never yielded to temptation, is the only man who knows to the full of what temptation means and only complete realist. Not in theory, not just saying about it, but he went through it and he came out, out of it sinless. Amazing. 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 He is the perfect priest. Hebrew chapter 2 verse 10 says this, in bringing my many sons to glory, it was fitting that God for whom, through whom everything exists, should make the altar of their salvation perfect through suffering. What does that mean, Pastor? He went through hell so that you can get to heaven. He went through hell so that you can get to heaven. He's the perfect priest. Point number three, he's the appointed priest. Hebrew chapter 14, 4 verse 14 says this, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who have ascended to heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. Jesus, or the word from the Hebrew writer says that God ascended. He was elevated to a place that was designated by God to be seated by someone who is worthy. 
Scripture says that Jesus sits now on the right hand of the Father. And there was a reserved seat beside the Father. He gave up the seat so that He can die on the cross. He earns the seat now to be the high priest, to mediate, mediate between you and I because of the work He done on the cross. And the Bible says now He ascends. He ascends into this place that He has been appointed to sit. Hebrew chapter 5, verse 4, 6, and 8. Let me just read this for your knowledge. And the Bible says this, And no one take this honour on himself, but he received it when, God called by God, when called by God, just as Aaron was. This described that Jesus was called. Verse 6, and he says that in another place, you are the priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Again, not only that he was called, but he was appointed to be priest forever. Verse 8, the Bible, sons through he was, he learned obedience from what he suffers. I want you to know this is what we call the process of call selected and appointed. And because he was found worthy, now he ascends and he sits on a designated seat that was appointed by God for his son who has been found worthy to sit on it. Hebrew chapter 5, verse 10 says this, was designated, des, designated by God to be the high priest. The word designated means it reveals that there is a seat that was appointed and only a person who's worthy to sit there will sit there. And we know from scriptures, Jesus became that appointed high priest because he was the worthy one to have sat or found a place or found himself, or found worthy to sit in that place. I remember of the book of Revelation. If you read the book of Revelation, you will find there was a period of time where heaven was in chaos. Amazing. Heaven was in composition. They were asking, the angels were asking this simple question. I'm paraphrasing. So who is worthy? Who is worthy to unfold the scroll? Who is worthy? Who is worthy to open up the scroll? Revelation. You read the scripture. And all of a sudden it says, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God. Let me tell you that. Because let me tell you something. It be cold and they started singing, Worthy is the Lamb of God. Worthy, blessing, honor, glory, power dominion to this Son of God. What it tells me this, what it tells me simply is this. Jesus came and ascended and was found worthy to sit where He was appointed as a high priest for you and I. He is an apathetic priest. He's a perfect priest and he's the appointed high priest. Jesus, our great high priest. But what does that mean to our faith? How will we respond knowing that we have a, free, a priest like this? Today, very quickly, I'm just going to share with you three things. I feel it's very important that we take this principle and learn from what the Hebrew writer is hinting and sharing with us, knowing that we have this high priest called Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Saviour. The first thing that the Hebrew writer says to us in the same scriptures that we just read, he says that let us hold firmly. What it means is this, whatever storm that you're going through, whatever you're going through in life, the first thing that you must understand, you need to stay firm. Firm because now that you have a high priest that is reliable, a high priest that is perfect in every ways, a high priest that is empathetic and understand what you're going through, you can hold firmly and you can stay firm in who he is. I remember taking my children overseas when they were younger. Interestingly, my children like to disappear when they're overseas. I don't know, maybe it's just my children but you sound your children are more obedient than my children. But whenever we go into a shopping center, my youngest one will disappear. She will hide under clothes, under the racks and things like that. And he will say, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Then suddenly, ta-da! 
you know, that's my youngest. My eldest disappeared for a while, and she was one found, you know, hiding, you know, or, or finding something, you know, and we could not find her, you know, we don't know where she is, and suddenly she popped up with a toy on her hand, and we asked her where she did, she get that, and we found out that what she did was she went inside a claw machine and came out and took the toy out and went back out through the hole and passed to us. She says, Daddy, I won. Daddy, I won. We told her that's not the, how the game works. So we told her to go back into the hole, climb up, and pull back the toy, and then we put a coin in play. That's not how it works, but she thought that's, that's how it works. Put the hole, go in, come out, take the toy, and come out. Okay? She was small then, so can you imagine the teenager trying to go in right now? It won't, just won't work. But what I'm trying to say is this, that I remember going to places where it was really, really, very crowd, crowded. And it's very dangerous. And as a father, one of the things I will do is that I will hold firmly to my children's hand. Hold firmly. But my children has to respond. My children must, must understand that daddy's hand is there not to restrict, but to make sure that you don't get lost. Right? So my children need to hold on to my hand, right? In the middle of all the crowds and pushing through the crowds in the mar different markets that we go through, I have to pull my children or hold my children in, by my side. But at the same time, if they want to let go, they can. True? And the Bible says, that the Hebrew writer says this, you have a firm God that is holding on to you, but will you hold on to Him? And the Hebrew writer says this, hold firmly. You know what hold firmly means? Let me just give you an illustration. Jer Ryan, can you come up please? You know what hold firmly is? Just imagine Ryan is my son. Kelvin, I borrow your son for a while. Hold my hand. Very good. I walk and I pull him through the crowd. But if he chooses to let go, he can. But of course, that's not the right image. Usually, parents will hold them in their hands, right? I will hold, but my children will try to go. And sometimes circumstances in life will push you away. But will you let go or will you hold on? And scripture says that knowing that we have a reliable, reliable high priest, you are to hold on firmly. Hold on firmly. Second thing, thank you, is that you need to step into. Scripture says in Hebrew chapter 4, verse 16, knowing that we have a reliable high priest, we are to approach. We are not to run away from God. We are not to run away when we have a problem of difficulty. We are not to run away when we have fallen and have, you know, have sinned against God. We are not to run away, but instead the scripture tells us this, is to come to God, to approach God, because there is grace, there is mercy. There are times when we need God's mercy upon our life. And the way that the Bible tells us is, is to step in. It's only in His presence that you receive mercy and grace. Point number three is this. You need to start receiving. It's only when you learn that our high priest is able to intercede and pray and provide in he, the Bible, Hebrew writer says this, not only that you hold firm, not only you step in, but now as you walk in, you can learn how to start receiving. It's interesting. We live in a society where, where, paise la, where faith is of great importance. Right? Faith is of great importance. Saving faith must look in a certain way, must say certain things, must behave in a certain way. But let me tell you this. Sometimes, or maybe most of the times, when we come to God, we don't need to put a face. We just learn how to receive what we need. Scripture says, mercy. No mercy. Sometimes I need mercy. Maybe many, many times. God, have mercy on me. Really have mercy. 
have mercy on me. And then from that mercy, place of mercy, He gives us grace to enable us to live the kind of life that we need. God, mercy la, cannot. La. Have mercy on me. God says, okay, I'll be merciful to you. Have some grace that will enable you to overcome. This morning, as we go through this series, as we stop into this series, Jesus Christ, our High Priest, can I invite you this morning to hold firmly to God, to step into His presence and to receive from Him who is able to provide. As the musician comes back up, as I was standing and worshipping, I saw a vision. And the word that came to me was this. Don't just stand by the river. Jump in the river. Don't just look at the river. Be in the river. Don't just enjoy the view. Embrace the experience. Jesus, our High Priest, perfect in all of His ways, appointed by God, able to walk you through your experiences. But, Hebrew writer says this, would you hold, would you step, would you receive? This morning, in the presence of God, I sensed this. I saw a river. I saw a river. And I think this is for us this morning. Maybe, you're just looking at what's happening. It's nice. Wow, so good, huh? This happening, that happening, that happening. Can I be very honest with you? God don't need consultants. God don't need con your consulting. Oh, the river like this, like that. God don't need. God needs you to come to His river. God needs you to receive from Him. God needs you to hold on to Him. I realize that sometimes as we progress as a nation, as we progress in our studies, progress in our development, we tend to be logical. We tend to be, you know, smart in our own ways. But I realized this. When I finished my doctorate, I realized this. I never wanted to be my, like my lecturers. I told myself I never want to be my, like my le lecturers. I want to be like a little child. I realized the more I learn, the more I don't know. The more I study, the more I don't know about God. The more I need to know about God. The more I need to experience God. And this morning, with that same heart, I feel that this is what God is calling Faith Assembly into. It's interesting, we had a conversation in the staff. If you, if you don't know, we are doing a renovation in our office. And I found out from my colleagues that we are naturally used to have a, a well right under our church. Natural well. Well. You know, maybe some of you say, Pastor, don't be spiritual about this. But you know, well are very important in scriptures. Well are very important symbols in scriptures. 
And I feel that there are deep wells that God wants us to draw from. And God wants us to jump and embrace and step into it. Not just look at the well. Wow, deep. Ah. Look at people enjoying the presence. But can I invite you, church, this morning? Because of a high priest, because of the high priest that paid a price for you and I, so that we don't have to worship from outside. Now we can worship inside. The guy who, the Lord who tore the veil into two, he became, he became the price. He became the mediator that opens the way, the high priest, so that you not be outside, but that you will come inside. This morning, can I encourage you? Can I encourage you? The next few moments, this, this altar call is very simple. If you feel that you have not stepped in, can I invite you to come to the altar to step in? I, be, I believe, I believe there's an anointing flowing. I saw it in a vision. I saw the river flowing. And God says, would you jump in? Would you not just see the beautiful thing that God is doing, but you embrace it? Next few moments, can I invite you to stand to your feet as we worship Nobody's going to pray for you. Today is very different. Nobody's going to pray. If you need prayer, lift up your hands. Pastor's going to pray for you. But if you really, what you really need to do is to step in. I want you to know, wherever you are, please don't run. Don't go to the toilet now. This is a very important moment. Okay, altar call is a very important moment. This is where you respond to God's word. I always believe this, that the altar is the place where our life is altered. So if that's you, says, Pastor, wow, I, I really need this. I really need to step in. I enjoy what people are going through. I enjoy seeing this and that, what God is doing. But God is saying to you, you, would you walk into that river? Maybe today is ankle deep. Maybe today is knee high. Maybe today is waist. Or maybe today you say, God, I'm going all the way completely because you made the way. You opened the door so that I can come in. I want to go all the way. If that's you, with every eye in this room, focus on Jesus. No one looking around. Just walk out wherever you are as the worship team begins to sing this song. Just come. You can sing.